<clears throat> Michael, right. good, to, good to see you. So Rachel, you want to start with the intros? Sure. Yeah, all right. So first, I just want to thank you all for joining us today for our online poetry series. Today, we have Emily Perez with us. Um, so Emily Perez is the author of um, House of Sugar, House of Stone, in the Chap Books Backyard Migration Route, and Made and Unmade. She graduated with honors from Stanford University and earned an MFA at the University of Houston, where she served as a poetry editor for Gulf Coast and taught with writers in the schools. A Canto Mundo fellow and Ledbury Emerging Critic, her poems have appeared in Cosmonauts Avenue, Copper Nickel, Fairy Tale Review, Prairie Schooner, Poetry Diode, and other journals. She is a regular reviewer for Rhino, and her reviews have also appeared in Boston Review, The Rumpus, and LA Review. She teaches English and Gender Studies in Denver, where she lives with her family. So thank you again for being here with us today, Emily. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks to all of you for being here. And John, thanks for inviting me to join you all. So Michael, we're gonna to have to talk about uh, the Avalanche hockey team for the first 15 minutes. Or not. Yeah, then we're gonna talk about the Celtics, and then maybe there'll be a poem or two that'll come in later in the show. No, I'm kidding. Right. I'll read all my hockey poems. Yeah, yeah, read all your hockey. Hey, I, we should have a sports poem day. Yeah, that's right, okay, good. I we would won't not do it be today. Person. Yeah, so Emily, you know, we, we start off uh, in every week with the same question. We've had some interesting answers. You know, what does refuge mean to you and, and where do you find it in your life? Um, that is a, I have been thinking about this question for a long time since you posed, since you first told me that you were setting up the reading this way. And something that I have come to about myself, I mean, something I've, I've come to understand in the, in the past several years about myself is that I have a, I have a very, very hard time um, asking for help and I have a hard time being vulnerable. And I think that um, refuge, uh, the act of taking refuge is an act of extreme vulnerability. Um, because if you're taking refuge in someone else, you're uh, making yourself vulnerable to them. Or if you are seeking refuge, you're showing that you're vulnerable to something. Um, and that's something that I really struggle with. And so I was thinking about like, where is refuge in my poems? And as I emailed you this morning, I hate to throw you this curveball, but I think I'm kind of a poet of anti-refuge or a poet of false refuge. Yes, yes. <laughs> that, Storm that I, the castle, yes. <laughs> that I have poems that are kind of uh, about places of, of non-existent refuge, like maybe looking for refuge in all the wrong places um, and uh, poems about maybe not being able to find refuge. Yeah. Um, so, but where I do find it, I mean, where I do find it in my everyday life, I find it in the people I love and the people who love me. Um, I find it in my family. Um, I find a lot of refuge in books. I yeah. think books have always been a place where I've uh, found just comfort, solace, and escape, um, you know, so I find refuge in nature as well. So I think those answers maybe are more, more universal, but then there's my kind of, uh, a, not aversion to refuge, but just my difficulties in asking for it. Well, I, no, it's the first time this season we've heard you know, the word vulnerability with refuge. Oh, really? Yeah, usually refuge is almost, you know, you're running towards something. Right. You know, there, there's a, uh, it's not a physical place, it could be. Right. But I think that uh, it, it's very interesting that you really need to be vulnerable to seek or ask for refuge. You know, it's not this bravado. Right. Hey, I'm going to do refuge, you know, I'm going to run down the street and run through a wall and that'll be refuge or mm -hmm. no it's very it, it's just listen it's making me think you know where am i vulnerable or yeah no i just think it's it's very interesting i appreciate you you know you you sharing that i never thought about it that way so there are some 
you know, we probably should start with the anti-refuge post. <laughs> like, I like that. Here. I like that. It's not anti-refuge. It's no, but I think part of it, there's a real, there's a real, you know, dynamic of, you know, seeking refuge and then not finding it. Yes. And where do you end up with that? So if I mean, if there's a poem or two you'd like to read now that kind of delve into that, you know, whatever you want to read around refuge, so. Okay, I'll, I've got a couple. I, I thought I'd, I'd try to start anti and then edge towards refuge as I could. So we'll see a, a minor emotional arc here. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so I actually have a new book. Um, so What Flies Want, it's a winner of the Iowa Prize for Poetry, it just came out in May. And um, a lot of this book is about avoidance. And so I realized that avoidance is one of those false refuges um, where you feel like you're getting some kind of refuge by not looking at things. Um, but of course, that's not true refuge. So the first poem I'm going to read is uh, an avoidance poem, and it's called I Wanted a Full Dose of Never Mind of Not Ever. I wanted a full dose of never mind, of not ever, will I, never again, not now, and not endeavoring to, please turn your gaze to another thing, less alarming. I did not want unsettling, the pit in the grip of the stomach's clenched fist, the wrench in the works of the mason's bricks, laid like a table set, but the guest not arriving driving out into the rain to call the lost dog we've known only weeks. He wrecks our sleep with responsibility. I wanted no last will and wishes, no testament unturned, unearned. I wanted soothe and settle, no nettle in the pudding, no pull in the stocking, no pecking pullet waiting for the ax to fall. I wanted full and saturated, uncurious, abated, tucked and trimmed, no hem, unsightly, no nightly news, no wedge issue, no ledge. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm trying to see if uh, see if I have a you know what is the is my parachute attached to the back? I'm just wondering if I'm ready to if I'm going to have a hard or soft landing after that one. So no, fantastic. Um, this next poem. So um, I'm Mexican American, but obviously very white presenting, and so thinking about my um, where I fit ethnically and culturally um, in the United States and how the context of where I live really changes how people see me and how people know me um, is something that I grapple with. And I've been in, you know, for years now, I've been thinking about whiteness and my own whiteness and realizing that um, whiteness and all the privilege associated with it is also a kind of false refuge or a seeming refuge to many, but a refuge that's very problematic. So I have uh, several poems in this book that also address whiteness. Um, this one is called Dear Whiteness. Dear Whiteness, you dyed all my dreams a deep white, sang me to white sleep, spread my peanut butter on white bread. You taught me to fill white boxes on a black background, crossword puzzle words like syncope and bespoke. Oh, your boarding schools. Oh, your long blonde hair and boys in letter jackets standing on the hoods of cars. Oh, your school shooters, your white collar crime. You kept your shirt sleeves folded crisp while you grabbed by the pussy business casual and when your sleeves unfurled, you wore perfect cufflinks. You taught me to believe in your salad forks, your Watusi, your grammar books, and the back staircase to which only you have the key, the one that will lead me to the top. Well, I'm never going to be able to use a salad fork again. <laughs> No, no, really, you know, very, very, very descriptive. Very, really, uh, I like, I don't know what you call it when the uh, the words kind of 
cascade, if it's alliteration or whatever, there's, there's always this, this kind of, you know, word carousel that's going on in your poems, which I like. Thank very you. nice, very nice. Okay, I'm edging towards refuge now, John. Um, uh, wait, wait, let me see. Oh, not uh, yet, no, okay. <laughs> if I have a seatbelt, uh, no, good. <laughs> okay, so um, I, my first book, House of Sugar, House of Stone is uh, really uh, based in a lot of fairy tales and using fairy tales as, um, as uh, personas, like to, from which to write persona poems. And I wasn't quite free of fairy tales for this book. Um, and one of my favorites, I just, when I read it, I was like, I have to do a poem in this and I don't know where the poem is, but there is a fairy tale, a Grimm's fairy tale called Hans, my hedgehog. And it's about uh, this couple that can't have a baby. So the dad goes, or the, fa or the man goes to like a local fair and he brings back a hedgehog. And the woman is pretty upset with this. She doesn't want a hedgehog for a child. So they store it near the stove and they kind of raise it, but they kind of neglect it. And eventually the hedgehog wants some emancipation. So they let it go be a shepherd and it lives in trees and it rides a rooster and it plays bagpipes and of course as these things go the hedgehog winds up marrying a princess who does not want to marry him um, it was a deal with her dad that she had no control over but because the hedgehog really loves her he becomes uh he decides to become a man and to do that he has to uh he has to flay himself basically to strip off all of his quills and have them burned and then he doesn't know what's going to happen eventually he is reborn as a man so um several years ago now um my husband walked out of his job and it was a really scary time for our family we didn't know where it was going to lead and i spoiler alert it turned out to be a really good choice but at the time it was really terrifying so this is a poem after the after the story haunts my hedgehog and it's called 10 years later my husband walks out of the woods and wait did your so, husband have quills he well that's a really we're gonna good, find out we're gonna some find people, out some people on this call would probably say yes <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah i see you mary catherine okay so <laughs> ten years yeah she's, yeah she's crying she's laughing so hard <laughs> okay 10 years later my husband walks out of the woods after hans my hedgehog in one version you remove your coat of quills at dusk drape it by the hearth side my father's bravest men then burst into our room and net the carapace, fling it into the waiting blaze, burn the thorns that stippled you. The hollow spires in the fire sing like copper smelted, the slag amassing on the flagstones, cooling to a twisted fist of all that had you hinged. Unmasked, at last you stand before me, born anew, not a monster, not a man, but a fledgling flayed. O oh, husband, what soul brave bargain have you made that leaves you so tender? And how am I to salvage you? Just wife, not witch, not doctor. Hmm. Yeah, I know the fear I left a job in 1996 without another job and there was that and it all turned out fantastic best thing i ever did but yeah when you're you're between trapezes and you don't know if there's a net below it gets a little scary so i i commiserate with your your feelings so, so nice, would, very nice i would say that is that's a poem maybe about trying to give refuge but not knowing if i can yeah um and then I have one more, maybe slightly more refuge poem. Um, and so a lot of this book also deals with mental, mental illness and mental health issues within a family. Um, and uh, as a parent struggling to watch my, my children um, deal with mental health issues and, and trying to, you know, get the help that we need. Yeah. Um, and so this poem is called my son is and i have a whole series of poems in this book called my son is and this is the last one of those my son is 
Did you know the night before your diagnosis, we had a break-in and when I woke, the door was open to the morning, just barely light, screen door swung out, front door swung in, and the jackets on the sofa, like the coat tree dropped a limb, raincoat pockets out like tongues, and an iron latch knocked off the giant chest in the living room, papers leaf littered the floor, blown as if a whirlwind had stirred just this side of the entry. What else had been altered? After the first break-in, the police told me to throw my things away, to buy new things, that I wouldn't want to think about hands on things. The night of the break-in, the night before your diagnosis, your father rattled awake and sloughed downstairs. He'd fallen asleep in your brother's bed. And perhaps the bunk frame's moan alarmed whatever spirit had tried our door, knowing we were careless, open to rummage, whatever shifted our entrance, swept out again. And sometimes you leave a door open, and sometimes someone decides to try the handle, and sometimes we don't swaddle what needs cradling. And then we went to the doctor, already cracked, spilled everything. Whew. I don't think I'm going by your house anytime soon. <laughs> okay. I'm staying close to the salad fork. I think that's my, oh, okay, John. that's my, re that's my refuge. You're Stay making, near the plate, the napkin and the salad fork. You're, don't you're making a bold statement here. I know that's right. I'm staying away from Denver. Uh, no, fantastic. Really great. So I want to, you know, uh, Emily, as I said in the email, you know, we have a little time where if, if the audience has some Q and A or comments, uh, you know, people have been putting things in the chat. Uh, you know, Margo, that's amazing. Julie Iron, so powerful, a punch in the gut. Uh, Mary Catherine was, uh, sorry. You know, Mary Catherine, uh, after your certain thing was no comment, LOL, wow, beautiful. Uh, Michael, beautiful, great poem. You know, does anybody, have any questions or other other comments for Emily? You could just unmute and uh, shout it out there. Sometimes we have that, sometimes we don't. Don, I know you're always good for one question. Come on, don't remember remember my thing. Don't let the poet off easy. This is the time to. I I'm just uh, I I'm. I'm so uh, thrilled to be here and to be listening to your poetry. It's, it's so brave to write about mental illness. It's so brave to write about being Mexican and not white or quote unquote. I mean, and job loss and are walking out of it. I mean, these are things that a lot of people have a lot of shame about and to bring this out is really so important and wonderful. And I, I'm I'm just amazed and I love your poetry and I, I know we're gonna have this again, but what is the name of the book that you put up? Uh, sure, I'll put it in the chat. It's called What Flies Want. Okay, great, thank you. So that's all I have. To, I don't have any questions. I no, no, it's great. No, Donna. Really enjoying it. Thank you. <laughs> no, Thank I you. think your your comments were really. You did exactly what I expected or hoped. So yeah. really nice, really nice. And thank and you. thank you, John, too, for everything. Yeah. Now this is my my time of the week to recharge myself into the poetry wall. You know, my <laughs> battery was getting low, so as I get near Thursday at twelve, um, you know. It's like your phone almost running out of battery. I need to run to the wall. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to do in July and August. I'm going to have to, I'm going to read poetry books. Read That's what books. I'm going to do on my porch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good.